So matter is just what conscious inner life looks like from a perspective. If I look in the mirror, I see my conscious inner life presenting itself to me in the form of an image in the mirror. If I look at somebody else's brain on their brain scanner, the images I will see on the monitor of the brain scanner are what the inner life of that person, the conscious inner life of that person, uh, uh, will be looking like from my perspective. So I would even define matter as what experiential states look like from a perspective. And is there something beyond matter? Of course, there are other experiential states that uh, are not directly translatable into matter, like uh, our endogenous feelings, our emotions, uh, even some of our abstract thoughts. Uh, uh, what we call matter is what presents itself on the screen of perception. In a sense, it is perception. But there are more experiential states than just perceptual states. If I lock you up in an ideal sensory deprivation chamber and you can't hear, see, touch, smell, anything, you will still have experiential states. You will still, you still have experiential states like desire, fear, uh, uh, um, thoughts, emotions of every kind. So matter is one part of the puzzle and it's certainly reconcilable with the idealism. Well, I mentioned earlier, I think matter is just what inner experience looks like from a perspective, from across a dissociative boundary. And I think the dissociative boundary that, that defines us as individuals uh, presents itself in perception as the skin, the eyes, our, our sensory organs. This, this is the boundary of the, this dissociative process in universal mind that we call ourselves. If you understand this, you will immediately come to the conclusion that what is really out there is not physical, it is mental and physicality is relative to mentality yeah um, and that's how physicality arrives from an interaction between two segments of mind at least two um, physicality so, is relative to mentality that's what quantum mechanics seems to be suggesting and um, the mentality part i added because i think it's inevitable it's the only other thing we know of next <laughs> to physicality <laughs> Uh, but quantum mechanics seems to be telling us quite unambiguously, especially after a superb experiment in 2018 that sort of closed all loopholes, that physicality is relative. But then relative to what? I would say it's relative to mentality. So in so far as each person is a observer, a different observer with a unique perspective, then your physical world is fundamentally different from my physical world because my physical world is relative to me and I'm taking a different perspective. So we all inhabit different physical worlds and your <laughs> physical world, and bear with me, the, don't misunderstand me yet. I, I have to complete this thought. Uh, but my personal intuition about it is that um, we are the same subject in different timelines interacting with, it, with itself across those timelines uh, if, yeah, yeah. if that is conceivable at all yeah um, so perhaps it is doing that through us perhaps we are those eyes that turn back and looked back at the at existence and said oh this is what's happening this is what's going on maybe yeah. the telos is this uh, universal uh, metacognition conscious uh, metacognition and we are just the beginning someone's opinion may contradict yours where's my friend alan it's all about your perspective who are we and what is the nature of this reality What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. I am super pumped for this episode. We're going to be talking about all things metaphysical idealism. We have Dr. Bernardo Castro joining us on the show. Hi, Bernardo. Hey there. Good to be here. Thanks so much for coming on the program. I'm so pumped for this. I have been intaking all of what you've been teaching about, and I think it's been super refreshing for getting us to think more deeply about what is the true nature of reality. Um, and I, that's just such a, this is a fundamental. Um, and for those who don't know Bernardo's background, he's a nine time author, philosopher of ontology and mind an AI and reconfigurable computing scientist leading the modern Renaissance of metaphysical idealism. The notion that reality is essentially experiential and you can find his links in the bio below to his website, bernardocastrup.com that has links to 
to his books, his papers, his essays, also his social media profiles. So check that out. All right, Bernardo, I mentioned this in the intro. Obviously, this is the most first principled question that we must not only ask ourselves as adults, but even inspire children at the youngest ages to have deep inquiry into metaphysics, the nature of reality, ontology, the nature of being, um, the what's the nature of consciousness. And so, yeah, this is this is the most first principle. And I really appreciate how the the push for idealism was very important. It was the, the first sort of ideas about that reality is inextricably uh, connected to our experience. And I think that that's, that was super important and awakening. I like your phrase, uh, omnis rest, animus est, everything is mind. And um, my favorite all, Latin logo. <laughs> your favorite Latin logo on, on the site as well, on your Twitter as well. Yes, yes. And you, in a good way to explain that is also all events, facts, and causes are soul, spirit, and feelings. That would be the broad translation of the Latin here. Yes. Now, I, I, I'm, I really want to see if there's a way to harmonize the idea of the single reality whose nature is consciousness with the idea of the so-called material, but evolution specifically, the fact that there has been an evolutionary process to get us um, to this point. So what, how do you um, bring the topics together of the fact that there has been this evolutionary process for the um, knowing to be enabled? Well, can we reconcile idealism with matter? Well, there is this thing out there, and even in us, that we call matter, right? There can be a dispute about what is it exactly? How do we conceptualize it? What true statements can we, can we make about it and what false statements? But there is this thing we see, smell, touch, that, that's undeniable. So if idealism cannot be reconcilable with that, it's just plain wrong, <laughs> right? Because there is this thing out there. Um, I think it's completely reconcilable because you see, um, we only know matter insofar as we experience it. If there is something out there that nobody ever has experienced, it might as well not exist. It becomes just a conceptual inferential reality. It doesn't have any, any true existence. Um, what idealism would say is that what we call matter is what conscious inner life looks like from a certain perspective. To be more specific, I would say from across a dissociative boundary, but then you start getting into the details. So matter is just what conscious inner life looks like from a perspective. If I look in the mirror, I see my conscious inner life presenting itself to me in the form of an image in the mirror. If I look at somebody else's brain on their brain scanner, the images I will see on the monitor of the brain scanner are what the inner life of that person, the conscious inner life of that person uh, uh, will be looking like from my perspective. So I would even define matter as what experiential states look like from a perspective. And is there something beyond matter? Of course, there are other experiential states that uh, are not directly translatable into matter, like uh, our endogenous feelings, our emotions, uh, even some of our abstract thoughts. Uh, uh, what we call matter is what presents itself on the screen of perception. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it is perception. But there are more experiential states than just perceptual states. If I lock you up in an ideal sensory deprivation chamber and you can't hear, see, touch, smell, anything, you will still have experiential states. You will still, you still have experiential states like desire, fear, uh, uh, um, thoughts, emotions of every kind. So matter is one part of the puzzle and it's certainly reconcilable with uh, idealism. Oh, sorry, I gave, gave you yes. an extended answer and I forget the second part of your question, Please. <laughs> evolution. Um, we have very, very good reasons to infer um, that the organization of living organisms has evolved. Not only that, even the universe has evolved. It started as a fairly uniform um, 
framework, so to say, and then because of quantum fluctuations and gravity being applicable to those quantum fluctuations, it started differentiating itself and formed, you know, eventually, you know, matter and stars and planets and moons and life. We have plenty of evidence uh, to indicate that. And I also don't think any of that is, is incompatible with idealism. On the contrary, it's even, it, it, it even substantiates idealism because uh, even if everything is consciousness, it's not only your or my consciousness alone. It's a transpersonal consciousness, so to say, spatially unbound. So we have to account for how individual private consciousness has arisen within this transpersonal background. And that's evolution right there. Mm, okay. So out of the which you've called a, like a cosmic consciousness or other people call an infinite consciousness. There is a, an, there is an, a private consciousness, as you said, or an individual um, consciousness that, that, that forms. And I really like how uh, Rupert Spira has talked about this idea of the preparation and like the more that you perforate uh, the, the this circle of the individual or the private consciousness, the more that you truly feel like you are, and Sri Aurobindo has talked about the simultaneity being a key of life. Can you simultaneously be an individual, be the universal and the transcendent at the same time? Uh, I think that's a really beautiful way to also put it. I like... I like how, yeah, I, I'm, I totally vibe on the idea that these are absolutely compatible things. I think, you know, and Sri Aurobindo also said that one of the main keys to life is to just never cut life into two. And if you, if you do that, if you always keep it at one, every time you try and break these concepts into this materialism versus idealism and, and like you try and like consciousness only versus materialism, it's just, it's just this idea of like breaking it up and trying to like, um, but I liked your point about sensory deprivation. I think that's an interesting one. So even if I'm, because especially for those that have been in sensory deprivation tanks, I think that's extremely salient because if you have been in them, you know that it it's just, it, it really, in a sense, it also kind of feels like the womb. And I think that's really uh, beautiful. But, and you occasionally sure you can maybe hear like a little bit of the, warm water like slosh against uh the side but really you're you're there completely sensory deprived and if you don't have a good job of taming the the elephant i mean the elephant is you know can be on cocaine and just your mind the elephant monkey mind just you know and so if you yeah, and so that's the idea that you still get some sort of bubbles of experience uh, even during a complete sensory deprivation. I would say it's the prime directive of mind. Uh, its prime directive is not to be quiet. <laughs> it is to generate experiences, endogenous experiences, and then deceive itself. Because if there is no deception at some level of reality, then everything just poof goes out of existence. So uh, reality uh, is fundamentally dependent on a certain level of self-deception. I'm not saying that it's personal only, there could be something transpersonal behind it, but it's the nature of mind to things up and deceive itself in the process. So when you are in a sensory deprivation chamber, you may feel very quiet in the beginning, but wait a little longer and you start seeing that it's almost in possible to stop that, that dynamism, that dynamic activity of mind to produce images, produce thoughts, produce narratives, and then deceive itself, get, get, gets all tied up in its own narrative. Uh, it's, it's the, the nature of the beast. <laughs> yeah. Bernardo, I'm so interested to hear your take on this. You hinted at it in this last segment. It's this idea that there is a, there's a, there's a list in a sense of there's like a catalog of biometric correlates to phenom phenomenological states of experience. I really like this a lot. And actually, I think the more that we collectively invest into science, identifying these biomarkers, um, and especially at the building better tools to understand the biometrics, uh, 
everything from EEG and fMRI to EKG um, to microbiome. So all over and then taking that readout and then being able to provide like a artificial general intelligence health corpus be able to, or AI coach can just, you know, provide these, in, these feedbacks, these insights into, you know, you, your heart rate variability is super low right now. You are stressed. And like, what's the, what's the, interaction that you know maybe going to the pool or going on a walk right or whatever it may be doing some motion um so how do you you mentioned this earlier about this idea that like if we had the biometric correlate of your phen phenomenological state we could in a sense have like a telescopic or microscopic idea of what that is so t tell us about your your reasoning process around that well, I mentioned earlier, I think matter is just what inner experience looks like from a perspective, from across a dissociative boundary. And I think the dissociative boundary that, that defines us as individuals uh, presents itself in perception as the skin, the eyes, our, our sensory organs. This, this is the boundary of the, this dissociative process in universal mind that we call ourselves. Um, so if matter is that uh, uh, what is what experience looks like from across a dissociative boundary, then the matter of the brain is no exception. Uh, neither is the matter of the rest of the universe, but let's talk about the brain. If brain activity is what our normal individual mentation looks like from across a perspective, of course there will be correlations. There will be lots of correlations. I would go further and say and suggest that uh, we could even come up with interventions in our uh, patterns of brain activity that could lead us to certain in desirable uh, inner states. Yep. Um, we know that um, uh, uh, psychoactive substances from alcohol to psychedelics, they intervene uh, with the matter in our brain yep. and they lead us to other experiential states. I would say that the psychedelic, the alcohol or the scalpel of a neurosurgeon when he's digging into your brain, this is all material. Therefore, these two are images of transpersonal conscious processes. The scalpel is what a transpersonal conscious process looks like. And it goes across your dissociative boundary and interferes with your dissociate, dissociated individual uh, experiential states. Uh, what it looks like is a scalpel cutting in your brain or a pill being digested and flooding your brain with a psychoactive substance. That one mental process influences another is trivial. Our emotions influence our thoughts. They are different, but they influence one another. So by the same token, a scalpel or a drug can influence our inner states. Both are images, our brain and that scalpel and that drug are images of mental processes. So if we can decode uh, the neurocorrelates of meta-consciousness or metacognitive awareness, which, I, which is what, was, what I think they are, uh, we can even find ways to intervene into our brain activity and force uh, desirable experiential states by disrupting ordinary brain activity uh, in just the right way. I think it is possible to develop this technology and I would look forward to using it. Yes, yes. Ooh, okay, this, this, uh, this bit's gonna, it's getting very interesting. So I loved the focus there on especially on entheogens and i love that word because it's about unleashing the divine within um and th it's without a doubt that there is a super highly correlative experience experiment with uh taking a uh substance that like an entheogen and then a, a, having a psychoactive experience that in a sense um could incrementally awaken uh, enlighten. And so this is where I want to take this segment now. Um, ultimately, we're, t we're talking about this idea of some sort of like a, an artificial general intelligence that's constantly taking in all of the sensor data like you have. Like today, we have jets that have hundreds of sensors that constantly monitor everything. But like what our body goes to the doctor one time a year, it's a joke. So the, so the idea is that if, if we're constantly analyzing that stream of sensor data from our body, and then we gave this idea earlier that there's even something as simple as an intervention for, for, for stress. Maybe you go out, walk, go on a walk, et cetera. But there's even deeper interventions, which you were hinting at. The idea that could it be possible to have a deeper understanding of a correlate of specifically enlightenment or awakening, something that is so 
causeless joy and imperturbable peace that is the essence of what it would be across brain, across heart, across gut, and then and then do our best to nudge our society in that direction. How does that resonate? I don't see any fundamental reason why that shouldn't uh, be possible. Um, I could imagine that under different circumstances, it could be impossible. You could speculate that maybe our brain activity is not the complete image of what's happening in our mind. It's a partial image. So by intervening in it, you're not intervening in a large segment that may be relevant. So you could speculate about that. I don't see a reason to think that. Um, I think uh, measurable brain activity, at, at least measurable in principle, there, there is activity in the deeper areas of the brain that today is very hard to measure with proper spatial and temporal uh, resolution. But I'm talking about what is possible in principle. Um, I think we can, in principle, measure everything that plays a role in our mental states. And it should be possible if we cared to invest and if we cared to develop the technology and do the research necessary to stimulate uh, uh, mental states that are conducive to enlightenment or which maybe are enlightenment. Um, we know anecdotally that many a psychedelic traveler, traveler uh, has maybe by sheer luck or chance, uh, uh, arrived at a mental state that they describe as unmistakably uh, enlightened. Um, you can't do that every time. You can't choose that that's where it's going to take you. Psychedelic trips are very noisy, unpredictable. They, they mix profound truths with, with profound delusions. So it's very hard to make sense of that. We don't have any control of that. But if we could develop a technology to control it better at the right resolution, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't be possible. Yeah. Yeah. There's... And that's this idea of uh, one, these interventions on the awakening or enlightenment trajectory is one sort of idea. In in a sense, they're 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 interconnected with these other ones, but just some general other ones where like, okay, you're having you know some back pain that we're getting an idea about like get up and go on that walk or go swim. Um, another idea, okay, we're sensing some you know some ghrelin. You 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 you're having this active sensation happen for you to want to eat, and so uh, but you want to fast today. So what is the intervention that could happen today to help you um, fast? And so what's your north star if your if your idea is that you want to become a deeper philosopher of mind or if you want to become a better artist or scientist or spiritual leader whatever you want to become what are those interventions that can help you achieve that north star yeah um there is a technology yeah. we call it a transcranial magnetic stimulation the name is a little bit misleading because it may be the opposite of stimulation it may actually dampen down uh, brain activity uh, it has beautiful spatial resolution. Um, it, it's basically an electromagnetic beam that goes across your skull and messes up with the activity of your neurons in, in, in the desired way. Um, and that's very promising. The problem is that it doesn't have much penetration. So you can activate or deactivate superficial areas of the neocortex, but you can't go much deeper. But yeah. that, that's an avenue of, uh, of um, R&D, uh, research and development that we could pursue to achieve exactly what, you, what you're hinting at. Yeah, that's, that's a crucial one. And uh, we've heard the analogies of it being like a, like a, a stadium or an arena and like you're just like outside the stadium or the arena trying to like understand what's happening on the field and just by like the bear the bear noise on the yeah yeah fair yeah. analogy, an analogy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the tools that's why it's so important to build better tools because the better tools um, enable more edge pushing to happen all right and it does seem like it's slowly going in the direction of an idea of like a service to self, like a more of a self-dealing, ego-driven uh, mentality of, of just survival and reproduction um, towards something that is more of an enlightened, awakened service to other consciousness. Um, do you feel that? I, in my optimistic moments, yeah, uh, the rest of the time, uh, you know, we, we've taken such an, an individualistic 
turn after the 60s, especially in the 80s and from then onwards, um, that it, it's hard sometimes to, to stay uh, positive. But there are some bright lights. There are things happening today that would be unthinkable uh, not a long time ago. Um, for instance, because of the, the benign influence of non-dualism in the West, which picked up steam really this century, uh, it started already back in the New Age movement, New Thought, but it really picked up steam uh, this century. We now have a language to talk about transpersonal mental states, non-dual states. Before, we didn't even have the language, the conceptual... Lexicon. That's so Yeah, important. the lexicon, the, the, yeah. Tool, the conceptual tool set yeah. to even talk about that, to say something coherent about it. And, and that has led to some disasters. I mean... Uh, uh, there was a book written about um, famous uh, Western philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. There's a yep. book written about him in 1994 by a supposedly expert uh, <laughs> on his writings and philosophy. And this guy had the temerity of criticizing Schopenhauer. But in doing that criticism, the only thing he revealed was his utter inability to comprehend Schopenhauer's non-dual ideas, his non-dual philosophy. Um, and why did that happen? Because, you know, I'm, I'm being kind to this professor now, because in 1994, we didn't have the language, the conceptual tool set to even, not only to understand, but to talk about what that guy was trying to hint at. He had to develop his own language, which in a way led to disaster because nobody really understood what he was talking about. But now we can understand. Now I can write a book talking about these things and, and, and people share the dictionary with me. They know yes. what I'm hinting at. So that's very optimistic. That's a good sign that things are going the right way. I try to remember this every day. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm so happy you brought that up. The more that we drive novel lexicon that is very clearly the essence of where our North Star is on our civilizational and individual trajectories, that's when it makes it more and more clear for us to share that corpus, like you were indicating, I, I, that's so, so critical and share that vision. You mentioned Schopenhauer, which is excellent. Um, I feel like the idea of nothing more fundamental than the will the inner nature of everything. I love that one. I love the one eye of the world that looks out from every creature. I love that one as well. So, you know, given, given the case of Schopenhauer and yourself, I mean, we now have significantly more than a hundred years ago had, especially thousands of years ago for talking like the Vedic Rishis and stuff, we have significantly more access, um, especially under our revelation of quantum mechanics and whatnot. It's just giving us more and more access to what we believe is that nature of reality. So let's talk about this. You've written about this quite a bit now. I find this subject to be... Um, really deeply interrelated between um, consciousness and physics in the sense that this is about um, the bottom up panpsychism and cosmopsychism that's, that's, a, that's occurring. A fundamental consciousness as a universe wide field. And that um, is, is, would it, would it be fair to say that there's a, there's some sort of an, abstract mathematics that are happening you know infinitely far away and that it's emerging it's emerging an illusory holographic space-time i think well, just just on a point of terminology uh, yes. you, you alluded to bottom-up panpsychism but you really meant cosmopsychism uh, bottom-up okay. panpsychism also called constitutive panpsychism, what they would say is that every elementary subatomic particle is conscious, but there is no universal consciousness. There are only gazillions of little tiny microscopic uh, consciousnesses. I think that's an untenable view. The only okay. tenable view is the opposite. There is only one cosmic subject and individual subjectivity is an illusion, uh, which is the view I subscribe to that would be a form of um, cosmopsychism. Okay. Now the mathematics, well, Alan, I think mathematics is how we describe things. Um, the fact that mathematical 
truths which are so intuitive to us, so intuitive that it's like it's self-evident to us. It, it has to be true, right? Two plus two is four, almost by definition. And you know, there are a number of much more subtle, nuanced math mathematical truths that we are absolutely sure are correct. And, and, and this psychological intuition happens to apply perfectly to the dynamics of the world out there. I mean, this in itself is extraordinary under materialistic uh, metaphysics because there is no reasoning principle why our axiomatic uh, rules of thought should be the rules according to which the world out there <laughs> evolves <laughs> and moves. Um, under idealism, uh, it's not a, a problem because it's a mind out there as well. Actually, it's the same mind and the division is, uh, the separation is an illusion. So uh, our axioms of thoughts, those rules of, of thought that we consider self-evident apply to the world because it's the same mind that is behind the world applying those same axiomatic rules of thinking. Um, but then we use this fact, this, this similarity between how, well, this equivalence between how we think and how the world behaves, we use it to our advantage to describe the behavior of the world according to these axioms of thought. And that's, that's what we call mathematics. We are describing the behavior uh, of the world. And what it, I think, ultimately informs us of is of how mind behaves. That's what mathematics is telling us. Uh, mind has some inherent patterns of behavior, which a Jungian would call uh, archetypes of behavior. Uh, Jungians went as far as to say that um, the axioms of mathematics were archetypal in nature. Marie-Louise von Franz wrote a book, I think in 1974, I think it's called The Number and Time. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure anymore about the title, but they explore this notion to which I subscribe. The archetypes of mind are the, um, how to say? The, like they're the, the fundamental source codes? That's one way to put it. Another way to put it would be to use a vibration analogy. You know, um, when you pluck a guitar string, it vibrates according to one of its normal modes of vibration. It plays certain notes, but not other. And that note depends on how long the string is, the elasticity of the string. Mm -hmm. So mind has its normal modes of excitation. Once mind gets excited, it gets excited in certain ways and not in others. Mm -hmm. So there are these archetypal uh, um, fundamental modes of behavior uh, in mind. And I think mathematics, uh, by giving people direct inner access to those templates, allows us to describe from the outside as well, how the world behaves. And it gives us profound hints to what mind is and how it comports itself. Interesting. So there, to, so it's more accurate to say a bottom up panpsychism, given what Cosmopsychism currently describes itself as, but if or you could say it more accurate, I would say top down panpsychism is a top down panpsychism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. From from mind, from from a universal mind a to universal individual mind, mind as okay. opposed to to from microscopic minds to us. To, uh, okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. So a top down panpsychism from universal mind to us, and but there there's a there is some interesting so the the feedback sort of function isn't necessarily from an a, a, like an abstract mathematics that are happening beyond the like quantum field level and then and they're going through this process of the uh, unfolding and enfolding as like david oh, bohm would say but but it could or from this universal uh consciousness level or this infinite consciousness level so it could you, you the idea is that it could be doing the un, the unfolding and folding from an the, the, those seem like the same no, I, thing to me as well this the, in that macro micro sense that's I, why I how you, yeah go ahead go ahead i see how you're visualizing it because the okay. laws of quantum mechanics are microscopic laws you're thinking in terms of uh, uh, the bottom up um i understand that um I think the way to visualize space um, is, is misleading um, wh when you go down that path. The laws of quantum mechanics apply to all space, everywhere. Yeah. These are fundamental laws. 
um, in modern physics, we even don't talk anymore about literal particles. We talk about excitations of a field. Yeah. Uh, particles are little <laughs> ripples on a field, like ripples in the water. There is nothing to the ripple but the water. In the same way, there's nothing to a particle but this field. Um, today, we still didn't manage to reconcile the different quantum fields. So we still talk about a set of them. But there is a very strong intuition in physics that uh, they are actually all facets of one field. Um, and this one field is not spatially bound. It doesn't yeah. have a size. It, 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 it is the entire universe. I, I, I was about to say it's in, it encompasses the entire universe. It, it is the entire universe. Um, and the laws apply to this spatially unbound field. So even if you talk about microscopic laws, we, a term that we use because we are not able to separate uh, and bring these laws into focus on micro macroscopic objects. They are hidden behind their own interactions. Uh, so to yeah. see them, we need to look at a microsco microscopic system. But, but this is an artifact of our ability to detect something. That something in itself is not microscopic. Mm. It is the behavior, the templates of movement or vibration, the archetypes of a spatially unbound quantum field, which is the universe. The laws of quantum mechanics are not even local. Mm. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, um, when you talk about microscopic laws, we are just saying that we can't discern these laws unless we look at very tiny things. It doesn't mean that the laws are only in the tiny things. No, they are in front of you right now. They are making this screen in front of you uh, okay. be able to exist and, and do what it does. It's just that we can't discern them at the macroscopic level. But the laws are not microscopic. They are universal. Yeah, okay, this is a very interesting. Way. So like, a, like an implicate or like a source code or an infinite consciousness or cosmic consciousness, that it, w it, w it pervades absolutely everything always and that it's not... Um, but this this part of it's this part of it's interesting you you mentioned this um there is a sort of potentially power law of the most common um um abstract mathematics re the relationships that are going on and that those most common relationships emerge in the holographic illusory space time as the most common archetypes uh yeah go ahead yes uh okay now now you hinted at uh, one of the most difficult topics in science and philosophy today um we do not have consensus about how the laws of quantum mechanics um which we discern at the microscopic level how they somehow give rise to the classical laws of physics, like Maxwell equations, Newton's equations. Why do these equations ap approximate so well the behavior of, of the world we see? And how do they emerge from a purely probabilistic uh, uh, framework, which, which is what seems to apply at the most fundamental level? Now, I'm, I'm on purpose avoiding the word microscopic. I'll talk about the most fundamental level. How does orderliness of macro, macroscopic laws arise or emerge out of the probabilistic behavior of nature at, at, at its most fundamental levels. We do not have a clear answer to that. There are many attempted answers. Uh, I'm right now reading an excellent paper by a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the leader of a, a quantum physics group in the University of Vienna, which I think is one of the most promising uh, avenues of investigation now. You have a uh, cubism, which is another attempt to make sense of this. Um, but it's an open question. Somehow, that probabilistic behavior at the most fundamental level preferentially leads to the emergence of uh, recognizable regularities, which yeah. we call uh, laws of nature. And then that leads us into recognizable phenomenological states. So then there's right. that relationship. So, so in a sense, we can say that there are specific, there's a feedback mechanism that occurs where the more that I, as my illusory individual, become 
more causeless joy and imperturbable peace, the more that I become that, the more that I cause a feedback loop to this source code that then makes the abstract mathematical relationships more in the emergent direction of that causeless peace, causeless joy and imperturbable peace. We do not know if and how these feedback mechanisms work. We haven't been able to, to model them. But I think it would be extraordinarily implausible to say that uh, the direction of influences here uh, is only in one way, points only in one way. Uh, I think it's extraordinarily implausible. I think it's uh, almost a virtual certainty that there are uh, feedback mechanisms uh, in operation here as well. Because we've known from complexity sciences, for instance, that it is feedback mechanisms that give rise to complexity. And boy, is this world complex. So uh, there, there should be feedback mechanisms, mechanisms operating at every level here, including endogenous ex experiential states uh, um, that, that, that are providing feedback mechanisms in a way that uh, we, we haven't been, been able to model and discern clearly yet. And we could say that then that feedback is potentially the idea of the co-creators, that we are these, we have a co-creative relationship with reality. This is an ex extraordinarily sensitive topic. <laughs> so uh, it, it's so easy to be misunderstood, uh, yeah. to be misunderstood when you talk about this. So bear with me. Um, there is an approach in physics, a very conservative, very level-headed, um, I would say unassailable approach for interpreting quantum mechanics. I would say it's not even an interpretation. It's an acknowledgement of what quantum mechanics is saying which is called relational quantum mechanics by an Italian physicist called Carlo Rovelli, who has written a number of very good books. Um, and what Rovelli says is that, uh, you know, if you bite the bullet of quantum mechanics from experiments, then there is no physical quantity, no physical entity that's absolute. They're all relative. Everything that's physical is relative to, to an observer, is relative to a point of measurement. Uh, which then immediately raises the question, well, if everything physical is relative, then is it relative to what? <laughs> Whatever it's relative to, it can't be physical. Otherwise, you get into infinite regress, right? So um, if you understand this, you will immediately come to the conclusion that what is really out there is not physical. It is mental. And physicality is relative to mentality. Yeah. Um, and that's how physicality arrives, from an interaction between two segments of mind, at least two. Um, physicality so, is relative to mentality. That's what quantum mechanics seems to be suggesting. I'm, the mentality part I added, because I think it's inevitable. It's the only other thing we know of next <laughs> to physicality. <laughs> uh, but quantum mechanics seems to be telling us quite unambiguously, especially after an, a superb experiment in 2018 that sort of closed all loopholes, that physicality is relative. But then relative to what? I would say it's relative to mentality. So insofar as each person is a observer, a different observer with a unique perspective, then your physical world is fundamentally different from my physical world because my physical world is relative to me and I'm taking a different perspective. So we all inhabit different physical worlds. And your <laughs> physical world, and bear with me, the, don't misunderstand me yet. I, I have to complete this thought. So, um, of course, we co-create our physical world because it's relative. It arises from an interaction between our personal dissociated mentation and the transpersonal mental states out there. It is from that interaction that our physical world is created. So we co-create it. We are half of the equation. However, we describe our respective physical worlds in mutually consistent manners. You also would say, well, there is a moon at night, there are stars, there are trees, there are cars, you know what I mean? Um, so the other part of the equation seems to be transpersonal mental states in which we are all immersed. Can we change that? I would say all indications are that, are that we can't because otherwise I would just conjure up the world to be much better than it is now. And I seem to be unable to do that. I don't seem to 
be able to create my own reality fully. And I understand that that's not what we are claiming either. You're not saying that we all create our own reality. You're saying that there is some degree of influence. So I would say there's a massive degree of influence as far as the physicality that surrounds you is concerned. But what ensures that your physical world is consistent with mine and with everybody else's is this transpersonal ocean of mentation that is out there. And then can we as individuals influence that ocean of transpersonal mentation? I personally think very little, if at all. Some of the greatest minds of all time have influenced that and made everything much better. I, I, I am open to that idea. But then you could say, well, uh, I influence the world in trivial ways. Like um, if I use my arms and I move a rock, I've influenced the world. But what you mean is, is something deeper than that. What I mean, mean I mean Michelangelo, you know. That, that's, yeah, okay. That, yeah, yeah, okay yeah. I'll go along with that. <laughs> but that's not what we mean, right? What we mean is, can your inner attitude yeah, influence yeah. the physical world through non-physical means? In other words, not through the use of perception and everything that correlates with perception. Can a thought, can a inner feeling influence something yeah. non-locally? Perhaps uh, there is some evidence that this could be the case uh, arising from research on so-called psi phenomena, for instance, at the University of Virginia in the US. Um, but I, I'm tempted to think that that influence is rather limited. Let me give you another example on that is even something as simple as like if we have the spectrum from, you know, Michelangelo to something very simple, it can be something along the lines of when you are with another person, especially if it's a, a family member or a friend, um, the idea is that everything is inextricably connected in this knot of life and that if one has that equanimity that immovable peace that causes joy just by that simple phenomenological state can significantly affect what the other person's experience is and so that slowly in a sense um it it takes the suffering out of the knot of life How is that? How does it take the suffering out? Because by your phenomenological state being that causes joy and imperturbable peace, it butterfly effects to the other per oh. yeah, in that in that knot of life. All of a sudden the other person feels your peace and then they themselves also take the notch down. And we all know of the scenario where you, if you go a notch up, they go a notch up and it just versus bringing it. So you slowly work out the misery and the suffering and the needless um, replaying of the worst possible uh, archetypal uh, phenomenologies. Yeah. I, I, this, this section has been super, super interesting. Um, in this last bit, is it is it possible to say that the like there is wherever everywhere is this source code implicate cosmic consciousness infinite consciousness? Yeah, it's non spatial. So non spatial it's everywhere or nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So we have this non spatial um, God. It's everywhere. Um, yeah, or nowhere. So so now this idea that. From this source code, implicate, etc. From there, we we have a we have a, a we have a power law of the abstract mathematical possibilities that exist, and then from there, it's possible that there is the emergence of phenomenological states, and that we have a direct feedback potentially influence on that the, on those abstract mathematical states by in in a sense we can drive the knot of life anywhere from a simple relationship making it better to being like a michelangelo or an elon musk and trying to drive some sort of massive artistic or technological revolutionary change to better the world well look um 
I, I think what you're hinting at is, is our, does our influence extend beyond the visual or perceptual cues that we provide? I mean, you, you, have that, you had that example where, uh, of um, a discussion that escalates. Um, you could say, well, it escalates because each participant is providing obvious visual cues to the other. He's speaking louder, his eyes are going wide open, he's gesticulating more. Um, but what you're hinting at, if I understand you, is that beyond the perceptual cues, beyond your physical action in the world, there is a direct influence between your inner states and the inner states of other people, and maybe the inner states of the universe at large. It, it's beyond the visual cues. Um, so that's correct. I see you're nodding. So that, that my you, interpretation and is And you correct. called that a transpersonal ocean? Well, um, insofar as there is a direct influence between you and something outside you, it's going through a transpersonal field of yeah, some field, sort. ocean. Some yeah, sort. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. drop in the ocean analogy. Yeah, yes. an ocean, a field. Yeah. These are all metaphors yeah. anyway. Yeah. But yeah. You, you get my meaning. Um, can that be happening? I think it can. It's a personal opinion. Uh, I think people who deny that that's happening um, are in a position to deny it because usually that happens together with all the visual cues and, and, and physical effects that we produce just by being in the world. We dis, you know, just by existing, we displace air. We occupy a certain volume in yeah. space. So because these things always go together, the so-called trivial influences, which are visual perceptual cues and your physical presence in the world, and the direct, more subtle influences, it's very hard to tease them apart so we can categorically say that there are these more subtle influences as well, as well. That's why it's so difficult to categorically say, yes, they exist, because it's difficult to tease them apart from all the other things that are happening. Uh, I think there is some research indicating that these subtle influences uh, do occur, um, but they are not massive, because if they were massive, I mean, give you an example. If, uh, if I knew that war is about to happen, I would immediately sit, meditate, concentrate, and stop it from happening. But I can't do that. I can't stop world hunger. hunger. I, can't, I can't stop the devastation of the environment that is happening around the world today. I can't stop people from getting sick. I can't stop my loved ones from dying from cancer and heart attacks. So uh, somehow, the so-called physical way of influencing, which does not entail a direct uh, inner connection, uh, but just your action in the space-time framework that we call the physical world, those seem to be overwhelming in relation to the more subtle uh, channels for, for influencing things. I think it's just an observation. It's not even an opinion. It's an observation. Um, and that's what makes it difficult to categorically pin down this other thing that might be going on. And the thing is, if it is going on, then it opens up a whole lot of other degrees of freedom. Yeah. Uh, so it's important to know whether they are actually going on or not. It, 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 it's, it almost seems like a, a fool's errand to try and say that it doesn't go on in the sense that if, if, if the, the, even the, the simple, beautiful, imaginative idea of a rock star electric car company that you know, may take two decades to actually get into um, solid production worldwide um, does end up that started just as that an imaginative idea now is able to distribute tens of thousands and more of these um, of the, what would what one could call the top quality electric um, vehicle across across the planet which then somebody else does in a sense exchange that value of, of money you know, for the, the vehicle. And so then they themselves, uh, they've basically taken what was an, an imagined, imagined, imagined idea that they themselves are now purchasing. And now it's in there as even yeah. a, something that they use every day. Um, and so, yeah. And, and that same thing is true about basically everything. And Steve Jobs was one of the ones that said that, you know, these devices, the phones and computers and, and, but everything else as well, were literally imagined by people and executed by people that are just like you. 
And so that's why the idea is, you know, there is, of course, a bell curve and there are people that are extremely conscientious um, and that are that can abstractly reason and that have emotional intelligence to work with teams and stuff like that versus other people that don't, but there's all these mixes in between. And, and so people have the possibility to make things even incrementally better, even at that, at that person level. And in a sense, Bernardo, I, I want to ask you this question as well. Are you fam you're familiar with cloud Shannon? And the oh, no, of course, yeah, course, yeah. and the, yeah, and so the the you know the idea that we we've been talking about kind of like what would be a hypothesis in some ways of what his work an extrapolated potentially version of his work would be. I have a way to to ask you about that process. <clears throat> Is it the same way to envision a zygote and the way that a zygote becomes an adult? And the same way that a seed becomes a tree and the same way that a big bang becomes a civilization. And there is that compact information theoretical substrate that does that process. And then there's, and then the, is there, would you say a recursive function as well in all of those processes? So you're alluding to uh, Shannon's information theory um, and communication uh, theory. Shannon was basically trying to model um, what colloquially you can refer to as the amount of information that is transmitted, given a transmitter and a receiver and a channel that has noise, and he modeled all that. Um, the information that is transmitted is inherent in the transmitter, so it's, it's not created out of, you know, uh, out of nowhere. Um, so if I understand your line of thinking, you're thinking about the information being implicit in that implicate order, to use it as a metaphor based on the, wor the work of um, uh, David Bohm. Um, and that information is just unfolding and becoming visible, exfoliating as an acorn grows into an oak or as the Big Bang grows into a civilization. Am I interpreting it correctly? Yeah. Whether that information, well, I, I, I would say it, it is an implication of determinism. Problem is determinism is not, doesn't hold quite well at the, at the quantum level. Um, I would say that almost by definition, whatever is, whatever happens, whatever unfolds, is the realization of an implicit, implicit potential of the universe. Almost by definition, because if it's happening, it was a potential before, otherwise it, it couldn't happen, right? So there is a, at least theoretically, there is a plenum, a, 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 a level in the hierarchy of existence where you could say that everything that has been is or will ever be already is as a potential and then uh, and then what we are interested in is, is how that potential unfolds and becomes a reality or what are the influencers of that process can we guide it can we steer it in a certain way uh, it's a valid question at the same time it's an extraordinarily complex uh, question. It may be, well, it almost certainly is uh, beyond uh, human cognitive abilities today, I think. Well, in a sense, <clears throat> the way that you can take a, a zygote and that you can begin screening the, the embryos and be able to, to take even maybe multiple embryos. And, you know, this is, you know, there's some bioethics implications that, that occur here, but to be able to screen many embryos and then to be able to identify ones that potentially have single or multiple point mutations that are causing downstream illnesses and say that, you know, let's not uh, continue the evolutionary process with that, but actually these that have a more, that have better health outcomes, but also that we can, you know, it is in a sense an ATC and G in a, double helix that can then be reprogrammed as long as you know we do this uh longitudinally and figure out the right combinatorics for the right outcomes um that 
the, it, we're doing uh, an, an interventional process that has these downstream effects. So in that analogy, it would be the same way that you can tweak zygotes, embryos, and th is in the same way can tweak the existing um, uh, making the Model T 100 years ago and then having the um, m motor vehicles begin spreading around the world or or now there's 100,000 or more commercial flights that happen every single day across the planet from the idea of like, we want to do that thing called flying. And so there there is a, there's a way to affect, you know, like John von Neumann would would call it like this strip in a sense. And like you are in a sense making a mutation in the strip and that mutation that you make to enable humans to fly across the planet for every, you know, uh, iteration of, of human that exists downstream is going to have the airplane present um, for them to, to enjoy. Look, the history of science is the history of uh, manipulating possibilities and putting things to work uh, in a way you want them to work for you, um, uh, using the laws of nature in your favor. Um, technology is basically applied science. Science is about figuring out what are the patterns of evolution. I'm using the word evolution here in a broad sense, not necessarily Darwinian evolution alone, but in the sense of dynamisms, things happen things are dynamic, they unfold, and therefore we can say that they evolve. Um, and the history of science is the history of figuring out how this evolution happens and then putting it to use for us, like creating a Model T and now you know, shooting humans to the moon on the top of a big rocket. Um, did, did this uh, improve our lives? Uh, from a certain perspective, undoubtedly, uh, uh, we, li we live longer, more comfortably. Uh, we have the means to do things today that previous generations wouldn't even uh, dream of. Of course, there are enormous ethical implications for uh, further increases in this power. You know, we stole the fire from the gods. Uh, we took the realm of uh, uh, evolution on earth. Um, and in all senses, even in the Darwinian sense, we have taken the realm now for how species evolve, which species will die, which species will live, we decide. We've decided that, um, for instance, wheat would be the most successful grass on the planet. We've decided it. We've decided that cows would be one of the most successful mammal, mammals in the world. Now, of course, from the point of view of the cow, that's terrible because they are being killed and tortured like pigs and chickens every day. But from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective, uh, they are on top of the world. There are more cows now than the many, 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 many more than has ever been in the history of this planet. So we've taken the realms, whether we like it or not. Whether we like it or not, it's our decisions that will uh, decide whether most of the species in the world today will go extinct or not. It's our decisions that will define whether we survive one more century uh, or not. So whether we like it or not, you know, we've stolen the fire from the, uh, the fire from the gods. And how to use this power correctly uh, is is a whole discipline in itself. It's it's ethics. Um, yeah. How yeah. far can we go in manipulating a nature, uh, which is basically everything, in manipulating everything? Um, when should we stop and say, well, we have the power to manipulate it, but we haven't yet acquired a sufficient understanding of what we are doing in order to manipulate it responsibly? Should you use the power you have um, for the mere fact that you have that power? Uh, or should you enforce uh, some meta rules on yourself and say, well, I have the power to change it, but I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing so I will not use it. I mean, um, to give you an, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a member of the computer retro community. Um, I like to fool around and change with uh, these old computers. Um, if you would give a computer to a kid, the kid has the power to press every key, to press different buttons, connect and disconnect things. But chances are that you will zap the computer if you do that. So the kid has the power to do that. Should the kid use that power until the kid understands what a computer is, how it works, how it's supposed to be used? So uh, I, I one could say the same thing about the operating system of the human body. 
as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And we are messing around with it uh, in, in all kinds of unexamined ways. Uh, for instance, we mess with our operating system just by watching television. And we mess it in a very bad way, just by watching television of all things, uh, by choosing where you breathe your air, you're messing with your operating system, by choosing what thoughts you think, and there's nothing new age about it. We know that uh, mind and body are deeply interconnected in surprising ways. By, by, by allowing certain thoughts to go unchecked, you are influencing your operating system. The thing is, when it comes to our, to our own body, we don't have a choice. Because choosing not to influence it is, in fact, to influence it in an unexamined way. So we, we, we don't have a choice uh, there, right? We better get our act together because whether we want it or not, we, we will be influencing it. But the mere fact that we are living, that we are going yes. about life, other things are not necessarily like that. Um, so I, I don't have the, uh, the ethical, ethical answers uh, to this. Um, I'm not an ethicist. Um, as a technologist, I, I have the... Intuit, not intuitive, the instinctual tendency to err by doing more than I should because I'm a technologist. And if I see that protean power in my hands, the, the fire of the gods in my hands, I have an instinctive urge to go and check and what, what can I do with this, to press the buttons, yeah. even if I don't understand the buttons. Um, but there is my id you know my freudian id the supervisor in my mind who's saying hey, hey, hey wait a moment don't give in to all of your instinctual instinctive urges because there are more things at play here but th th that's about as much as i can say about this uh Alan. Mm. It, it, it feels like a lot of that has to do with what has been quoted as this pause the pause that is what enables us to be observant rather than reactive and that pause when unlocked the promethean fire um to pause and to observe and to compute the combinatorial longitudinal effects um take yeah. stock before you start messing about with things right i would i would say that look th there are certain problems we face today that where we no longer have the luxury to pause and contemplate. We have to act, even if we don't know exactly what we are doing. For instance, um, if I take climate science seriously, which I do, I think we are no longer in the luxury position of pausing and, oh, let's see how this goes. Uh, for all we know, it's already too late. The, the fact that we don't know it is already an urge for action. And I would be willing to endorse, nobody's waiting for my endorsement, but uh, for, from my, in my own mind, I would be willing to endorse people who'd say, hey, let's develop some technology to actively try to compensate for the climate effects that we are causing. Let us, I don't know, let's blanket the it's, Sahara on a, on a white sheet. So and, it's, no, it's, in a sense, it's so simple in the sense of just transitions uh, intelligently uh, from the use of hydrocarbons uh, to nuclear fusion and all of these other extremely uh, futuristic Star Trekian styles of energy and complete abundance for all. And for use the um, mass energy equivalents to make replicators and syn synthesize whatever you would like from pure energy um, it, and this it, it, it really is in a sense going like like what do you want for your great grandkids in a hundred years you know you want this absolute flourishing prosperous society for them and for all and so the question then is how do we make that those incremental architectural steps and and why not galvanize the world? Like one of the problems that Eric Weinstein talks a lot about is just that what's going on with our like sense-making apparatus around allocating the brilliant minds with the proper incentive structures to things like the SDGs. We know that solving these things like the SDGs is exactly one of the biggest longitudinal um, success points that we want to have, yeah. 
you touched on a number of things that uh, that are my buttons. <laughs> so <laughs> bear with me. Look, the first thing is um, for as long as our mainstream metaphysics metaphysics is materialism, people will not move to better the world for four generations in the future, because you know their grandchildren will be dead by then they will not get to know their great grandchildren and they will be dead uh, and under materialism they will cease to exist so it, it is all quote immaterial what will happen for generations from now and that's a big problem of materialism because it sort of stimulates this short-term pillaging mentality which is very dangerous uh, but yeah. under idealism hey your great grandchildren are you in mm -hmm. another form so is a mm -hmm. planet so are the birds. Yeah, yeah. You know? So you, you, have any, uh, you have a stake. You're invested in this. Yes, yes. Um, now, having said that, uh, the problem of energy that you touched upon and these futuristic uh, energy sources, energy is the key. Because you see, we can solve everything else if energy is for free and abundant everywhere. We yeah. can desalinate ocean water and have potable water anywhere in the world at the drop of a hat and solve the freshwater crisis, which is one of the biggest looming crises in the world today. Um, um, recycling. You know what the main problem of recycling is? Is that it's a major energy drain. To recycle things, you need to heat them up. You need to reprocess them. It consumes a lot of energy. Um, but if we could have energy for free everywhere, we could recycle everything, everything. Another one, the food crisis. Hey, vertical farms would solve the food crisis. What's the problem? Yeah, you cannot count on sunlight because sunlight only hits the top layer. The layers underneath are in the shade, food doesn't grow, but you can put artificial lighting. Yeah. You can put LEDs and you can grow things 24 hours a day yeah. uh, in urban areas to feed yes. the entire populations. Why don't we do that? Because it takes energy and energy is not available everywhere. Now, the reason we got away from the magical, abundant, forever source of energy, which is nuclear energy, is that it's unsafe and it produces waste. Uh, uh, um, that is, the risks of, store, uh, of storing that are just unacceptable. Uh, but we think of nuclear energy in terms of the 1950s, when reactors needed what we call active safety. In other words, if everything shuts down, then the reactor explodes. Uh, if you pull the plug on everything, the reactor explodes because it needs to be actively controlled. It's active safety. Uh, since then, we have passive safety nuclear reactors, thorium reactors, wave front reactors. This technology exists. And these reactors are such that if anything goes wrong, the whole thing shuts down. You know what I mean? If, if you pull the plug, the whole thing just shuts down. The reactor doesn't react. The reaction doesn't continue unless you're constantly stimulating it in just the right way. If Fukushima hap happened, and that was a passive safety reaction, a reactor, nothing would have happened. The whole thing would have just boom, shut down with that wave. But we and that's think, fission, and we have fusion, tokamak, stellarator. Oh, that's, that is even ether. better. Yeah. That's even better, but it doesn't exist today. Uh, and that's the galvanization of, of resources and talent um, to tackle the, that. Yeah, yeah, but I'm insisting on this because passive safety reaction reactors exist, but the laws forbid us from doing more R&D and deploying them. Now, imagine for a moment that we could deploy them. These are reactors that use as fuel, spent fuel from old generation reactors. So you would clean up the earth um, by, by using them. Uh, if we would deploy them and have the courage to understand that the technology has changed, we could deploy them everywhere and we would solve nearly every problem. We could recycle everything, we could grow uh, uh, vertical food farms everywhere, desalinate ocean water. I mean, the world would be different, not to mention the fact that we'd pollute a lot less because these reactors uh, produce no airborne uh, pollutants. Anyway, this was my pet subject. I, <laughs> I, I, I wanted so to get happy. it out. I'm Sorry so happy about that. you did that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so happy you did that. You're like, there were so many of my buttons pushed there. I must get this all out. I love that. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about if we observe the the observers that is this now 
the notion that there are a an infinite amount of observers and that there is a there is a a, a dimensionless singularity that is indivisible and undescribable and that there are all of these potential infinite observers and that there is an evolutionary process that is occurring in all of those. And we can even just focus it in on this one, but I am curious of what you think about those, about that other idea. It's almost like that the, that the, 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 the function is to validate the infinity, like, and that's why the infinite observers occur. And then there's that evolutionary process. And then the idea is that, the telos, telos of this evolutionary process potentially baked right in there in the initial source code, like we were talking about earlier, is that telos to Ouroboros? Is the telos for the recursion or the, the quine? Um, what, what is the, that telos? So it's both that, that, that infinite consciousness multiversal perspective plus the telic perspective. I, I think you hinted on at the answer already, and and I, and I think you know you did. I would just agree with you. Um, uh, just to, on on the terminology, um, I think there are infinite perspectives, but one observer, like Schopenhauer said, yeah, the yeah. one eye of the world that looks out from every creature. What is different is the perspective, what goes in your visual field in each instance, but the eye is the same, the subject is the same. I think uh, uh, the subject in you is the same subject in me. If we would become amnesic in a, an ideal sensory deprivation chamber together, what it's like to be you would be identical to what it's like to be me. Uh, we would basically be identical. What changes is the, is the perspective, but it's okay to to talk about multiple or infinite observers because that's how physics defines the observer. It defines it in terms of the perspective. But philosophically, I would say it's the, the core subjectivity of every observer is the same. So there's actually yeah. only one uh, yes. observer. Yes, that is, that is then in a sense, uh, f f you, could, you could say um, fractaled out. As yeah. A, yeah, yeah. You, you, can, you can immediately get intuition about it by closing one of your eyes. And then and, uh, two perspectives, the same observer. That's interesting. Um, uh, That's in, interesting. In the, yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you put your finger in front of your nose and you look with one eye and look with the other, you see that the part of your finger that you see with one eye and the other is completely really different. Completely different. Yeah. Uh, so the, there isn't even a, a part of the finger that is common to the two perspectives, but the observer is the same. This the is very is, Examples, very interesting, even at the child level can begin getting that yeah. Yeah. yeah the only difference is that uh, in the case of what's happening here uh the two perspectives are separated but they are co-conscious in time or at least they uh, seem to be uh, i have a friend uh, professor bernard carr who was first student of stephen hawkins i'm not sure i should publicly say this but not that i started a sorry bernard if i <laughs> If I, if I said too much, uh, he's working on a theory of time, a multidimensional theory of time uh, that may explain why or how one subject can be many. And my personal intuition about it, not necessarily what he's saying, I don't know what he's going to say, uh, but my personal intuition about it is that um, we are the same subject in different timelines interacting with, it, with itself across those timelines, uh, if, yeah, yeah. if that is conceivable at all. Yeah. Um, so where is this all leading, right? Yes, where yes. is that acorn uh, leading to? <laughs> how, how would the oak look like? <laughs> um, I, I am an empiricist uh, as well. Um, so I take my cues from what I see happening. And if you look at the evolution of life, which is the apex of cosmic evolution as far as we are aware of, uh, I mean, you look at how life is evolving and what is the apex of that? there is a very important sense in which we are the apex uh, in the sense that we have become for good or worse the dominant species on this planet uh, what is it that has allowed us to occupy this position what is the unique 
cognitive ability of our consciousness as humans that has differentiated us from everything else alive in the world today and arguably everything else that has ever been alive on this planet in the, in the last three and a half billion years of the history of life. I would say it's metacognition. It's our ability to not only experience things, but to know that we experience things. It's the ability to say, I am having this thought, as opposed to just having the thought. It's, ability, it's the ability to say, I am the one having this feeling, as opposed to just having the feeling. Um, when my cat um, is eager to go out in the morning, my cat feels the eagerness. It's an experiential state. But I think from, from my cat's perspective, he is the eagerness. My cat, I don't think, has the ability to step out of itself and say, I am the subject feeling eagerness. I am not the eagerness. I am the one having the eagerness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Douglas Hofstadt uh, called this uh, stepping out of the system in his monumental and magnificent book, uh, Godel Eschebach. Mm. Um, it, we have this ability to step out of ourselves, step out of the system, and then contemplate the system from the outside. And the system is us. Uh, but we have this ability to metacognize, not only cognize, but to cognize the cognition. In other words, metacognize. So insofar as we are the apex of the evolutionary trajectory, and what defines us as consciousnesses is meta-consciousness, in other words, conscious metacognition, self-reflection, self-awareness, then I would say the whole of nature seems to be pushing towards this ability to metacognize, to self-reflection, self-awareness, to the ability to not only feel, but to step out of the feeling and say, I am the one having the feeling. And maybe beyond us, nature is instinctual. And it's overwhelmed by the flow of its own instincts, which probably is not very pleasant. Um, it's very, probably very confusing, very stressful, um, or perhaps um, uh, fantastic as well in, in other ways. I don't know. Um, but it, it's not able to step out of itself and contemplate, it, contemplate itself in the way we can do that. So perhaps it is doing that through us. Perhaps we are those eyes that turn back and looked back at, the, at existence and said, oh, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. Maybe yeah. the telos is this uh, universal uh, metacognition, conscious uh, metacognition, and we are just the beginning. I don't know. Yes, this is where I could also include some of the existing technological advances that have enabled us to feel even more like we are getting a a mirror of the nature of reality. And those advances are things like artificial intelligence. They're like virtual realities, um, simulation technologies. Yeah. So then that question is that, is it then, or Ouroboros and recursive, is the, is the tree dropping the seed for another tree? Metacognition is the ability to turn your cognition towards itself. It is the Ouroboros. There is no better symbol There's for no metacognition better, than the Ouroboros. Ouroboros. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's when you stop looking out and you turn to yourself and say, oh, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking. That is the Ouroboros. Ouroboros Metaconsciousness yeah. is Ouroboric. That's right? super interesting. And, and, and so the relaxation of the awareness um, into the simultaneous uh, individual universal transcendent, the feeling of truth when you relax the awareness inward is the epitome of the Ouroboros. But then yes, yeah. on the, on the, I like that a lot. And then on this, on the trajectory of where it seems like an automata uh, orthogenesis is what it kind of seems and feels it's growing towards, right? Yeah. yeah so look back at itself. And yeah. yes, yes, there, and then there's that Ouroboric moment, like you just described, but then there's another, like, whatever ends up happening with the synthesis of AI, VR, simulation technology, wherever that ends up going, uh, there's the transcension hypothesis of 
going John Smart of going inward and that kind of solving like the Fermi paradox and stuff like that of just the Ouroboric moment of of going into infinite designer virtual worlds and just going into the, the next the inner world which is the outer world <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it uh, is yes yes yeah. uh, um uh, this is rich territory. Um, I think this is a fascinating subject. Uh, to go back to technology, um, do you know the Oculus Quest? That's yeah. virtual reality. Do you have one? I've played with it, yeah. Okay. Uh, I own one. Um, and there is something uh, everybody can relate to without a psychedelic trip, just by using that. Of course, a psychedelic trip brings the same insight a thousand fold stronger. But if you use the Oculus Quest for half an hour, you become so immersed in that, you take it so much for granted as reality, <sighs> as the world where you are in, that when you take it out, then you realize, oh, I'm in a completely other world. That's the first thought. And yeah. then the next thought is this too. Maybe yeah. just it, like that. That's the next thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what makes me believe that right now it isn't the exact same thing going on? Yeah. Um, you have that a lot with psychedelics when you trip you have the feeling that uh, what you're experiencing during the trip is more real than real. It is so palpably and richly and unambiguously real. And then you come back and you tell yourself, well, that wasn't real, right? Because after all, what is real is where I am right now. And then you think, oh, wait a moment. <laughs> Maybe the exact same thing is going on. Uh, I can either say that both are real, which is okay, or I can say, both are unreal because if you tell yourself that after that unambiguous feeling of reality you come back and you point at it and say well but that was not real then what reason do you have to say but this is you see yes, yes. Um, um so yeah i think vr uh, mind manipulation technologies are going in the way uh, of facilitating this kind of insight which is ironic right because you would think you know meditation and non-dualism you know the eastern traditions uh they would not converge with the madness of our technological society but, they uh, but guess what it, uh, yeah. Yeah. oh man that's probably one of my favorite focuses is that grand synthesis of the yeah non-dual eastern spiritual perennial wisdom with what is the rocket ship of what has happened in since the enlightenment industrial revolution towards this uh computers were just such a massive um unlocking it it may even be that like biology has an automata orthogenesis to create computers um and an, and an artificial like we are a biological bootloader as elon musk said and i i think that's quite fascinating and interesting and then the the recognition that the west did create a serious amount of of a flourishing across there's just no better thing for you to do when you have a like a serious like a femur snaps or something than for you to go to um you know like western medicine medicine yeah, yeah exactly so so there's that and then there's also like yeah like a ai is somehow and vrs and simulations are somehow synthesizing with like indigenous and spiritual wisdoms of the planet, which is super interesting as well. So yeah, that's, this is such a big interest of, of it's, it's just that whole idea of not dividing into two and realizing that it, it is that. It's the same source code there in the implicate order, right? So it shouldn't be surprising <laughs> that it's unfolding, it going in the same directions, but somehow we cognize it as surprising. Uh, look, I, I, I am an admirer of Eastern traditions. Um, no question, uh, no questions about that. I'm an admirer of um, Native American traditions. Me too. Um, I'm an admirer of African traditions, Me which too. are, I think, are uh, unjustifiably um, ignored. Yeah. Because the African thinks with his heart, and 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 that's something we we need that color in the rainbow of humanity, uh, if yeah. you know what I mean. Um, but I am. 
a very proud outcome of the Western tradition. I don't poo-poo the West at all, like um, many of us seem to do. Um, I think the Western path may be misinformed as it may be, or whatever you can say about it. I, I think it is a valid path. It's just a path that carries more responsibility than everybody else, because we have the Protean fire in our yeah, hands yeah. and we can end the game for everybody uh, in the drop of a dime. Um, so yeah. that means that our responsibility is greater. You can even ask, can the earth afford the existence of the Western tradition? Is this not too big of a gamble? Because the payoff is drastic. The payoff may be instant forced enlightenment 100 years down the road. You know, no need for 35 years of meditation, man. Just to put this little helmet and there you are. That's a major payoff. But, but the risk is fantastically high. Um, that said, you know, I, I, I'm a proud philosopher in the Western tradition. And I think we poo-poo our own tradition too much. We should, much. We should honor what is ours. We should honor our inheritance like uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, exactly. Immanuel Kant, going all the way back to Parmenides. How many yeah. people know what yeah. Parmenides, Parmenides said? Parmenides said, yeah. And, and how many people interpret him correctly amongst yeah. the ones that know what he said? I mean, 12 scholars in the world? I mean, it's ridiculous how much we ignore our own tradition while turning our eyes to the richness of other traditions, which are mm -hmm. unquestionable. I think the influence of Eastern traditions in the West has been very useful, very benign. It has given us language, a conceptual tool set that we didn't have, but this should not come at the cost of our own tradition. We are products of the Western world. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's so, so well said. Then there's, there's always room at the big buffet of union. This, again, Yoga does not mean holding a stretching pose. It means union in Sanskrit. So please, everyone, remember that forever. Um, and at this big buffet of union, that there are all of these options. And for the, for the parent to expose their child to the options and to follow the child, to follow their curiosity, and for the child to truly dig the well to water in the sense of realizing that infinite consciousness at the same time as for them to be able to sample from that buffet, some West, some East, some science, technology, biotech, neurotech, VR, AI, quantum sciences, all the way to understanding what the Buddhist teaching or, or, or Lao Tzu's um, teachings, Confucius's teachings, the African traditions, the um, Native Americans, just, just there's so much richness to select from the buffet. In this yeah. sense, the more exposure also that you have, at least um, to, you know, become leverage that Pareto leverage, only looking at maybe the five or 10% of all of those that give you the most uh, like 80 or 90% understanding of what the essence of it is. And if you get really efficient at that process in education, then you become that polymath that is able to put on all of these different costumes to engage with the world in all of these different ways. And you're, you're making novel connections between fields that nobody else sees. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in the process of doing that, one of those, clothes to put on should be our own, right? Yes. Uh, yes. But uh, let me give you an example. Um, I think there is a profound point when um, an Advaita teacher says, thought is your enemy. Your monkey mind will just get you caught up, caught up in all kinds of conceptual narratives and you will completely lose sight of what is right under your nose, which is who you actually are and what is actually going on. We get so you know, tied up in that conceptual web. Uh, so thought is your enemy. There is a very important sense in, in which this is correct. But you see, the West has a tradition that uses thought to get you out of the web. Yeah. Uh, uh, Peter Kingsley calls this um, uh, logic, true logic. 
um, as opposed to just reasoning. Um, he, he considers true logic uh, an enchantment. It's, yeah. a, it's a way to enchant your own mind out of the delusion. You know, to sort of throw some fairy dust in your mind in a very subtle way, and ah, you see it. And we have a tradition of people using logic to do that, like um, Zeno's paradox of paradoxes. You, you, you nod, so you know about it. But you probably recognize that there are many people who never heard of Zeno's paradoxes. That's a way to use logic to tie you up in such an impossible conclusion, in, in inner contradiction, that it, it works like um, that Japanese haiku, no, not the haiku, um, uh, how is it called again? Uh, it's part of Zen Buddhism. Haiku oh, is a poem. At, uh, oh, um, uh, part of Zen Buddhism. Oh, the like the one hand clapping or- the, Yes, yes. It's like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So oh, the, I has, forgot what the word is, but yeah. yeah, yeah. If I blanked, you blank too. I mean, this happens so frequently, yeah, yeah. right? That's our non-local connection here. <laughs> uh, so uh, 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 Zeno's paradoxes work like that. And yes, in yes. modern science, we have the tendency to say, well, now we figured out the answer to Zeno's paradoxes. No, we, we, we have the notion of limits and derivatives and integrals. We can make sense of that. But, Actually, you can't really, because you make sense of that by imagining that you've reached a limit that you actually never reach because it's infinite. It's an infinity. So you actually don't make sense of it. You just postpone it infinitely. Um, and, but we, we don't follow that path. We say, well, you know, forget logic, forget the thoughts, forget the monkey mind. Um, th there is an important sense in which that's true, but uh, it makes us blind to our own the richness of our own inheritance, our own tendencies, our own tools uh, to, to get there. And, uh, you know, I'm making a point of it because it's one of my, you know, I have a beef with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I like to highlight it every time I can. You, you bring up what is probably the most um, salient and simple way of endeavoring as a more thought-provoking human in our world, which is posing these questions of this true logic, where when you do pose such a question, it makes the other person, uh, the, the, comp the, the does not compute um, emotion or, or like the mind blowing emotion. Yeah. yeah it, 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 it's inspirational because it, it, it drives people to, uh, to further inquiry that they that they didn't know that 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 those things existed and like you said there's so much there's so much malware that is <laughs> yeah programmed yeah. in yeah. yeah and and we treat these things as mere curiosities like a little game you play you don't get an answer for it but then you just dismiss it oh it's just a little little game it's not these are tools for for very deep uh, thinking um, but we dismiss them. It's unfortunate. Yeah. And then, and then the, Rupert Spira said there's this difference between a something that's not real, which is like the square circle um, or taking the half the distance to the wall. Um, yeah, that's the Zeno's paradox of uh, Achilles and the tortoise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Achilles never overtakes the tortoise. You can prove that logically, <laughs> that he can never overtake the tortoise. <laughs> it just causes a tilt, you know, in uh, old arcade uh, games. If you shoot the machine too hard, it would tilt, it would stop working. So uh, Zeno's paradoxes ah. just tilt your logical mind. And that's how they take you out of the story because you realize yes. that if you follow the logic very strictly, it sort of sh short circuits, it contradicts itself. And then there is a moment that you go like, ah, space is not what I think it is. Well, yes, yeah. now you are yes. there. And now yes, you yes. got it. But then you immediately come back. And there's these cards that I think are, are another very interesting way to do it is you, you take these, you take three of these little cards and you put the words uh, past, present, and future on them. And then you give them to somebody and you say, um, order them as you please. And then there are certain people in the world that put them in order of past, present, future, like a linear order. And then there are other people in the world that stack all three on top of each other. And, and I think that these are also those small, in a sense, uh, like 
there's it's like true logic it's also kind of like um mind-blowing activities it's it's questioning the nature of reality in fun childlike engaging ways you could even write the number you know i think even people like Takashi 69 have come up with interesting things. Just put the number six on the sheet of paper and then you look at it and I look at it and you see that I see a nine and you see a six. And it's the same thing with the dress. The dress in 2015, about oh, half yeah. yeah, half of people saw it as as black and blue, and half people saw it as gold and white. And um when you when you um there's also the the necker cube and the ruben vase um there are all these different ways of if if you slowly incrementally um realize that it's not that your you perceiving the dress as gold and white is incorrect and me perceiving it as blue and black is correct but that both of us are holding that <laughs> truth like that simple recognition. So all of these activities that we've been talking about are all just really solid ways to, to bring activities and questions to adults and children to slowly bring them towards a more awakened state. Yeah. I and love technology, that. VR, surely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that, Bernardo. Let's, um, let's wrap. I have uh, one thought to, to wrap with you on. Um, I've been enjoying, oh, by the way, everything we were just talking about is about cleansing the doors of perception. The William Blake, Aldous Huxley, um, Arthur Schopenhauer style of, yeah, of cleansing those, those doors, um, awakening them. And okay, let's, um, let's, let's wrap with this thought. I've been toying around with the idea of like a dreamed symphony as a very interesting analogy for the nature of reality. And so whatever that source or that implicate or that infinite consciousness, um, that, that dimensionless singularity that's indescribable and indivisible, that that is in manifest, whatever the function may be of self-determining its infinity, whatever the function may be, um, it, in a sense, we can analogize what exists right now as a symphony in the sense that all of us are artists in the symphony. And that, again, the idea of the illusory um, uh, individual, the, the artist, just not what it appears to be, but that we, we have this like unique contribution, like you're going to play the clarinet. I'm going to play the piano. Someone else is going to play the sax. And we're, even if you play the same instrument, you're still going to play a different melody or a different harmony than other people will. Some people are maybe playing a little bit more out of tune because they're in like the service to self mentality. They're still thinking themselves as the ego and separate and um, and other people are in the service to other they're playing in tune mentality um so and our like slowly our like symphonic evolution has like the the conductor is like the attractor we can say in a mathematical system towards like an ouroboros or whatever the telos is so how do you like that like dreamed symphony analogy I think not only is it an excellent analogy, it may be the only viable uh, analogy. Um, and let me try to tell you why. Oh, by the way, I, I would prefer to say that I am the violin being played and you are the cello being played. <laughs> and I, I, I like that better. Um, Expand on that too, more for us. Because uh, otherwise you have a very dual thing, right? I am playing the violin as if the violin were outside of you. Uh, and then you have to account for that duality. Uh, while if I am the violin being played, I am the result of the play. And that's why I'm different of you, from you and you are different from somebody else. We are all unique notes being produced uh, by this okay. underlying uh, instrument. Um, and, and that, look, the idea of notes appeals to vibration. What is a mm. note? It's a vibration in air, which is produced by the vibration of a, uh, a string, uh, or a hammer uh, or a column of air in a in a uh, in a in an organ um, and it is crucial to have this as the metaphor it's the only metaphor i've found so far because it allows us to make sense of diversity if all there is is oneness 
it's the only way for you to explain diversity if you postulate that only oneness is truly yeah. real. Yeah. Um, because diversity is then the variety of vibrations or the yes. variety of excitations of that oneness. Yes. Um, uh, if it, look, a guitar string can, you can produce different notes with it by plucking it with, in different ways or by holding uh, the, the chord at different, different points, different, holding the string at different points. Um, but there is nothing to any one of those very different notes other than that one string. Uh, right? Uh, the only thing that's going on is the string in movement, but there is nothing to the note but the string. If you remove the string, there is no note. Uh, it's like a ripple in water. There is nothing to the ripple but the water in movement. You can't take the ripple out of the water. You can't do that. If you take the water away, there is no ripple. The ripple is the water. There is nothing to the ripple but the water. Yet, you can have ripples of different frequencies, patterns of movement, heights, uh, momentum, direction. I mean, it, it, that's how you get diversity from oneness. Yes. It's, the, it's the metaphor of vibration. So I think you're right on. Wow. I love that. And I know that uh, Sri Aurobindo said that the, um, the, the diversity of the oneness is the mathematics of the infinite. And, uh, yes, uh, and, uh, and, and that bring, uh, look, even uh, science is coming, well, a philosophical part of science that arguably is not real science, but, but it's very interesting. Nonetheless, M-theory, the idea of M-theory is that everything, uh, all reality is constituted of patterns of excitation of a hyperdimensional membrane or brain, as they call it. Uh, and you can write all the mathematics for that. So yeah, even, even physics uh, seems to be heading in that direction. I think it's an unavoidable yeah. insight. Patterns of excitation. Yeah. And I uh, know this is getting so interesting. I'm so pumped for, for further um, explorations here. Who else have you heard talk about the, um, the Dream Symphony? Because I want to research them as well. Oh. I have a good friend um, called uh, Fred Matzer. Um, he, he's publishing a book next year. Uh, he has a film out called uh, Beyond Me, uh, and he talks about it. But uh, and I sort of plagiarized him a little bit because he's the one who said, I am the violin being played. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Interesting. I'm not playing, I am being played. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and his idea is that uh, individuals don't really exist, they are illusions. So if they don't really exist, they can't be playing anything because they're yeah. not there to play to begin with. But they may be pl being played. They may be, yeah. they, they may be being played. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Good. And or Aurobindo also talked about the body as the receiving station for universal music. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's another metaphor, right? Yeah, it's the same metaphor. Actually. Same, same metaphor. Yeah. So yeah. this is so interestingly triangulating on the nature of reality. And I'm so pumped to embed these beautiful wisdoms that you've been able to share with us. Plus also that you've been teaching and that are also from all of the leaders because both of us we stand on the shoulders of such massive giants and this, this big synthesis that I'm super pumped and passionate about is really the, it's, it's the culmination of like the apex of critical thinking around the nature of reality. And, and it's really, really important to use metaphor. It's so important it enables conversation at the highest levels of abstraction exactly and the way you you started the interview you make you, you said something in the beginning that i didn't react to but i didn't forget you were saying <laughs> uh, you know idealism versus materialism mind versus matter these are all dualities yes they are and they ultimately hold no water because there is ultimately only one thing going on. The problem is, and that's what you alluded to right now, to get into the discourse, we have to make a concession to the current rules of the game. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I make a dualist concession when I label my view idealism as opposed to <laughs> materialism and all the rest. Because if you don't do that, you don't get into the conversation. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. once you are in the conversation, 
you can make the conversation implode from within, which is my <laughs> evil plan. But I have to get into it first. <laughs> <laughs> this is such such an interesting way of, of viewing it is that there's this there's this like bell curve that we could call like you know somewhere around maybe 95 percent or so people fit within two standard deviations and we could call this like the evolutionary pacer um, where many people are focused on survival and reproduction and many of the symbols that are being exchanged like memes are of uh kind of that 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 um, they're they're not at the uh, the the edges of the the bell curve at these tails because what's going on at the the regressive tail are still some people violence and slavery and it's all these bad things but at this very progressive tail there are people beyond two standard deviations that are the ones that are at the highest levels of abstraction that have to then create some sort of stories and metaphors yeah. like we got to do some Harry Potter. Um, Pixar, Walt Disney style communication of the stories to get um, the center, the evolutionary pacer for people to kind of like level up, like we're shooting yeah. portals in a sense for people to jump through. And like you said, there has to be uh, sometimes this like concession just because you can't bypass the gatekeeper yep. uh, unless you do these concessions or maybe if you embed the stories in animations or music or other things but even then like i i, I really like your yeah, point we, on we need myths we absolutely need the myths uh, otherwise, otherwise we don't have a democratic process so we need modern myths and we need to take myths seriously not literally Seriously. Seriously. Yeah. Ooh, Bernardo. Wow. Such a powerful conversation. Thank you for joining us on the show. I had a lot of fun. It was a, it was a pleasure. I just looked at the clock now. It's been almost two hours. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so fast. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about all of the subjects that Bernardo was teaching us about. Just get going on a more, on a more, become a, a deep truth, drew a deep student of the nature of reality and be, make that, if you make that your first principle, you will be able to have a more happy, peaceful, robustly enlightened and successful life. You will be um, at that at that level. Um, so do do that and inspire more people around the world to do that. Check out the links in the bio below to Bernardo's work. Check out his website link that has all of his essays, his books, his papers. Check that out. Also his social media links are there. He has a YouTube channel. He has a Twitter. So check that out and support him. Support the other people in your communities that you believe in. Um, begin that process of really mimicking biomimicking um, through inclusive stakeholding of, of, of the way that we can um, help fund the people that we believe in. Um, so, so help, help each other out in that sense. And that's, that's all folks. Thanks so much, Bernardo. Again, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Boom. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace. Fantastic, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs>